Well, we got a couple transfers visiting Syracuse this weekend, and here to talk about it is the executive producer of Q Sports Talk at ESPN Syracuse Channel 97.7, Jordan Capozzi. It's Locked on Syracuse, and it starts right now. You are Locked On Syracuse, your daily podcast on the Syracuse Orange, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome everyone in the Locked On Syracuse podcast. I'm Jackson Holzer and thank you for making us your first listen of every single day here on the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. And I hope that this episode is more compelling than the ending of that Masters because it seems like we can never get a good ending of the Masters these days. Today's episode is brought to you by LinkedIn. These days, every new potential hire can feel like a high stakes wager for your small business. That's why LinkedIn Jobs helps find the right people for your team faster and for free. Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on college. Terms and conditions apply. And we're joined by Jordan Capozzi over at, at, he is the executive producer of Q Sports Talk on ESPN Syracuse channel 97.7. Jordan, let's just talk about this Syracuse basketball offseason, shall we? Let's do it. All right. So, Judah Mintz recently leaving. What was your reaction to Mintz leaving? The whole thing was odd. I had um, I'd gone through this debate with some of my coworkers, you know, Stephen Fonte, Pauly Sibilia, the whole gang. And I think Judah is an undeniably talented player, uh, one of the best Syracuse has seen in a good amount of time, I would say. The one thing with Judah that always got me, is this team was meant to run up and down the court. At least that's what Autry, I think, has planned, and I think we'll see more of that coming up. And uh, his main strength, I would say, was getting to the foul line. He was sometimes the only guy who could you know, do anything in the half-court offense, create his own shot. Uh, but at his core, he's getting to the line 12 or so times a game. And that just made me wonder. Um, he saved this team a lot this past season, but... I do think there could potentially be better fits in terms of everybody gelling, everybody getting theirs. So you're disappointed to see a guy like that leave. Um, But I do think it's a good chance, you know, for a fresh start for Autry to get all of his guys in there. I think we're going to see a whole different roster, as you know, as anybody watching this knows. Uh, Then just the entire situation with him actually leaving was wild. Um, and I'm sure we'll talk about it a bit later, but it's funny because Jair Davis, the potential Delaware transfer, is kind of going through the same thing where uh, reporters are trying to get the scoop out early and the guys want to make hold, their own hold announcement. On that, hold, hold on on that, because <laughs> Mike Waters is a Hall of Fame reporter. Oh, yeah. That, that reporter who broke the who broke the Jair Davis is coming to Syracuse is a um, not a reporter. I was like, who is this guy? Usually if I have to ask who you are when you're breaking news, that's usually not a good sign. But yeah, I mean, Mike Waters, he he stole Judah Mintz's thunder, so to speak. But I think we both agree that it wasn't really surprised that he was leaving Syracuse. I, I guess... What I have to ask you now is, I mean, do you think he's going to get drafted? Where where do you see him in his pro career? Okay, so here's what I'll say. I don't think a lot of people thought that Buddy Beheim was going to play NBA basketball. But the difference, obviously, is his main asset is the one where if you can do it in the NBA, you have a job, obviously, shooting. Judah's game's different. You know, he's scoring twos, not threes. Um, he's got to have the ball in most cases to make things happen. So I don't see him getting drafted. I could be wrong. Um, I I do think he's going to go pro no matter what. I know he could still technically pull out of the draft, transfer, whatever. I I actually don't think he can. Really? He hired an agent. Oh, okay. So there you go. So either way, um, but I've heard for a while now that he's just committed, committed to going pro. Um, So I honestly think he just lives the G League life. Uh, Some team will give him a chance, I would assume. Uh, Maybe he goes overseas or something, but uh, I don't see a situation personally where he gets drafted. If he does, it'll be be late, and he'll have to scratch and claw his way. But you also never know. It takes one team. You impress one team in workouts, and they'll give you a shot. Um, I wish him well, and I hope he does end up playing in the NBA uh, very soon, but I don't see him getting picked personally. Yeah, I also agree with you on that because, 
Listen, all we really have is the mock drafts and we can go through all of them. And well, I did the other day. I looked through about like 10 or 11 of them or whatever it was. And I can only find one where he was actually drafted. And it was written by a guy who then two weeks later, the same guy wrote that he would not get drafted. So I I don't judge a kid for making a decision that he thinks is best for himself. But at the same time, Judah Mintz, and Buddy Beheim, Buddy Beheim can shoot the basketball. If you can shoot, there's always a spot for you on an NBA roster. But what concerns me about Mintz, and everyone's going to probably share this concern, is the shooting. If you shoot less than 30% from the three-point line in college, how do you think that would work in the NBA? I mean, you're going against bigger, stronger defenders in the NBA, and not to mention the three-point line is two feet back. It doesn't seem like it would work. It, it doesn't seem no. like it would work for The thing that kind of baffles me too, and you know, it's not as easy as just work on it, bang. And I think he was a little more confident this season, but uh, I've been referencing that kind of meme a lot. Like you had one job. Like that was the one thing he had to do in terms of improving his draft stock. And I would say most people who watched him didn't see a significant improvement. Again, I do think he was a little more confident and that's half the battle, but You know, and I'm not an expert. The mechanics still looked kind of funky at times. And uh, obviously the percentage didn't increase significantly. So uh, yeah, he's got time to work on it, but you've got to think having Jerry McNamara as a, as an asset to you and not being able to make a big leap. um, It doesn't give me a ton of confidence moving forward, but I, I think he proved a lot of things this past season, just not the one thing he needed to. I mean, he did increase, I think it was he doubled up on his 20 plus point games and he's definitely efficient at getting to the free throw line. And I saw there was a concern out there about his free throw shooting. And I'm like, that's the least of his concerns. That is the least of your problems because the the, the free throw line doesn't change in the NBA. It's still the free throw line. You can, you can build on 76%, which is around where he was. That's, that's a fine percentage in the NBA. When you're hiring for your small business, you want to find quality professionals that are right for the role. That's why you have to check out LinkedIn Jobs. LinkedIn Jobs has the tools to help find the right professionals for your team faster and for free. And guys, LinkedIn is something that I use all the time to check out the latest opportunities because LinkedIn isn't just a job board. LinkedIn helps you hire professionals that you can't find anywhere else, even those who aren't actively searching for a new job, but might be open to the perfect role. In a given month, over 70% of LinkedIn users don't visit other leading job sites. So if you're not looking on LinkedIn, you're looking in the wrong place. On LinkedIn, 86% of small businesses get a qualified candidate within 24 hours. Hire professionals like a professional on LinkedIn. LinkedIn knows that small businesses are wearing so many hats and might not have the time or resources to hire LinkedIn is constantly finding ways to make the process easier. They even just launched a feature that helps you write job descriptions, making the process even faster and quicker. 2.5 million small businesses use LinkedIn for hiring. Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash college. That's linkedin.com slash college to post your job for free. Terms and conditions apply. It's Locked On's NFL Mock Draft live on April 17th at 7 o'clock Eastern, streaming on the Locked On Sports Today 24-7 streaming channel on YouTube or the free Amazon Fire TV channels app. Find the ultimate six-episode series on April 17th at 7 Eastern to hear who the local Locked On experts are picking for every NFL franchise with live reactions from local college football experts and even the fantasy football angle. The Locked On NFL Mock Draft on April 17th at 7 Eastern, streaming live on Locked On Sports Today, 24-7 streaming channel on YouTube, or the free Amazon Fire TV channels app. We're joined by Jordan Capozzi, the executive producer of Q Sports Talk on ESPN Syracuse Channel 97.7. We're going over the Syracuse offseason so far. Obviously, Judah Mintz declaring for the NBA draft just a couple days ago. Let's now shift our focus to maybe even replacing Judah Mintz. And one name that sticks out is Dakota Lefew, who's, I don't know if he's still on this visit right now at the time of this recording or when I release this, but 
Jordan, if he were to commit to Syracuse, how do you think he would fit in? I like it in terms of one thing Coach Autry has been saying since he took the job was versatility. Uh, you look at this guy, 6'5", um, he'll be an absolute menace on defense. Uh, I want to say he shoot it around 36, 37 from three, which, you know, yep. that's all you really need. ACC, um, obviously, it'll be a little tougher than what he was facing at Mount St. Mary's, but uh, I think it's serviceable, and I think it's at least enough to be a threat and to get all the attention off guys like Chris Bell. Um, obviously, Ingolstadt come and gives you faith that uh, – uh, Lefew will hypothetically follow. Uh, and I'm just like looking at who all the guys are following on Instagram because, you know, that's what I do. I think it goes in order of uh, recency is a big part of their algorithm. Yes. A lot of cute guys, a lot of cute guys, let me tell you. So um, I, I think he's going to be here uh, and uh, I think it'll be a good fit. I I'm just interested to see how does Westry play into that? Does Kyle Cuff sniff the floor? Um, but I think that'd be a really good start for him. And then, you know, he has somebody there he's comfortable with in terms of Engelstad. So I, I'd love to see it. You can't teach size, right? No, you can't. I mean, I my one concern with him is I don't think he's a true point guard. He's more of a combo guard. But my theory has always been get the talent and then figure it out from there. You got to get the talent first. Yeah, and they've got spots I, too. Yeah. I, I appreciate the detective work on Instagram and Twitter followers, by the way. Uh, but there is one thing of note, which is I know that Dakota Lefew has a scheduled visit with Villanova as of this recording, but Villanova just got a guard in the transfer portal. So is that maybe, I mean, we can kind of go like this, the, the, who, who is it? The Brian Windhorse meme. <laughs> well, why is that? I thought well, you were doing sketch. I thought why you were is, doing the double sketch. Why is Villanova getting a guard? in the transfer portal when they are supposed to have Dakota left UConn. Why is that? Why is that? So hopefully he comes aboard. I don't think that Kyle Cuff really is going to sniff the floor much, but that's not really a bad thing. See, uh, I don't either, but it makes you wonder, you know, he could go somewhere else and play more than he hypothetically will on this team. That's the yeah. only reason I wonder. And, you know, he showed a willingness to play hard-nosed defense, which sometimes that's the guy who you need in there. But I agree. I think it was a Leader Johnson college basketball writer uh, put on Twitter X, whatever you call it, uh, a day or so ago that Villanova, um, Dakota Lafue going there, doesn't have a lot of juice. So uh, I'm liking Syracuse's chances based on everything I'm seeing. I'm almost surprised nothing happened over the weekend, but uh, you know, um, there's, there's still... Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Just just wait, because I know what's going to happen here. I'm, I mean, I'm supposed to release this at 9 a.m., but I am convinced that between now and when I release this recording, we're going to get some news. Just, just because, actually, no, it's going to be after this ends. I, I already know it. It's, it, I, I've already thought it over a million times. But another one who might be committing soon is Jair Davis. And of course, we had a pretend reporter leak out that he was already committing to Syracuse. That re pretend reporter might not be wrong, but I guess I'll ask the same question with Dakota. How do you see Davis fitting in? This poor guy. You're killing this poor guy. I don't remember his name, though, so I can't defend him. Um, and Davis commented the question mark on there, too, which I thought yes, was hysterical. That's, that's what made it. That's why we all saw it to begin with. If he doesn't comment on it, I'd never see it to begin with. I like the look of it. Um, you know, six, seven, it seems like, a, you know, three, four combo kind of similar to what Donnie would be. But they're definitely different players in the sense that I expect Donnie to have a lot more of an outside game. Uh, than Davis. I'm just, that's what makes me curious about the whole thing. I do think Davis is going to be coming to Cuse again, did the stalking. It all checks out. However, why would a guy going into his final year of eligibility come to a team to come off the bench? And I know um, if Autry's method is anything like Bayheim, which I think we saw it was um, with how he handled Justin Taylor last year. I don't think who's starting matters to him. I think it's who's closing and who's playing the big minutes. Um, but that's going to be the odd thing with me is, is Davis going to be consistently playing a lot? I imagine he's got to have a baseline of 20 something minutes to be yeah. thinking of coming here. Um or is it going to be a thing where maybe if Donnie's not doing super well, does Davis start kind of creeping into his playing time? Um, it, it's a good buffer to have because I think Syracuse fans thought they had that last season. And then the injuries kind of came about. 
Um, but it's, you know, it'll be nice to have hypothetically a ton of experience on this roster. And if he's willing to come and not start, I think it just shows he's a team player and the type of guy you love to have, right? Yeah, I mean, I the thing is, is you're concerned about, you know, who's going to start and everything like that. Because good you don't, to have. What? Good I issue mean, to have. It, yes, it is definitely a good problem. I mean, it's better than last year's problem, which was, oh gosh, who are we starting today? Uh Oh boy. All right. We got, we got two holes in the starting lineup already, but look, you need depth at, at the very least you need depth, right? I mean, you can't put all your eggs in one basket on Donnie Freeman. Love the guy. I've heard nothing but good things about him, but e- even if Donnie Freeman is playing 25, 30 minutes a night, you need someone behind him to be the backup four. So why not make it a really, really good player in Jair Davis who can also play the three? And hey, defensive situations, who do you want on the floor? You want Jair Davis or do you want Chris Bell? I mean, hey, if we can get a – there was one point in the season where Chris Bell over like probably a month or so was averaging a block a game. I know that's a skewed stat. That's not – What it shows, though, is if he wants to go out there and try to play defense, he can be better than what we see a lot. And I think a lot of Chris Bell this season is going to be – you remember when uh, Seth Greenberg was talking to him last year uh, post-game and he was telling him, you know, how he needs to turn it up every time. And I think Autry's got to hammer home to him over the offseason. Like, look, you could be one of the best players in the ACC if you give us your all on both ends of the floor every game. You go out there, you miss your first two or three threes, make it up on the defensive end. Uh, go out there and have a seven-rebound game more than once. Uh, that I thought that was an error in the box score when I saw it. And uh, I think Chris Bell has that potential. It's just, I don't want to say getting him to buy in, that sounds harsh, but when you're watching him on the floor, sometimes you're, you're like, why aren't you trying to go out there and grab that board? You probably could have gotten that one. Um, I do think late in the season we saw it a little bit. But I also think that kind of relates to uh, when he had hot games. So, but but I think Bell's going to be just a massive piece this year. If he takes a leap, uh, I think that makes this team pretty scary. Personally, I I, I think so too. And I, I think he already took a leap with his yeah. shooting. I mean, he shot like I believe he was third in the ACC in three point percentage. So at the very least, if Chris Bell stays the same next year, he's one of the best shooters in the conference. But my problem with him was, I don't know if it was really an effort problem on the defensive end at times. I think just sometimes I look at him and I'm like, man, your feet are made of cinder blocks. Like you just can't move. Like you, how do you teach someone to move laterally? Like I, I I don't know. He's, and by the way, with your, your block game thing, that is kind of funny, but at the same time, when it comes to those type of stats, to to me, they don't really matter until it gets goofy. And by that, I mean, like, a guy like Eddie Lampkin, who they brought in, who had five blocks all of last season. I mean, like, seven feet tall, you have five blocks. And that tells oh, you what you need to know about his defense. But. It's the same thing as Judah. Um, Judah averaged, like, between two and three steals a game last season. And he, on at times on defense, could be a dog. But there were also times where, you know, he, he kind of just let his guy get by him. I don't know whether it was he didn't want to pick up fouls or maybe he, you know, just wasn't as great of a defender as I think the stats would have showed. But I totally agree with you in terms of the stats thing. But I do think it shows, though, that he has at least the athletic ability. But you're right, you know, getting up and down off the floor is different from moving your feet side to side. But all things he can work on. I know you can't necessarily teach it, but he can get a little quicker with the feet. (laughs) I hope you can teach it. I hope. It's playoff time in the NBA and NHL. Baseball's in full swing and FanDuel is your place to bet on every game. Right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets guaranteed. That's $150, win or lose. Bet on everything from slap shots to home runs to slam dunks, all on an app that is safe, secure, and easy to use. One bet that I'm looking at as a New York Mets fan, hey, they've won another series here, is Mets Minus 124 at home against the Pirates tomorrow night. You just got to believe in the Mets, right? What are you waiting for? Visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and make your first bet an automatic win. FanDuel, America's number one sports book. 
Locked On has launched the first ever national sports 24-7 streaming channel on YouTube, and now it's also available on Amazon Fire TV in the free Fire TV channels app. Locked On Sports Today is here for you 24-7, covering the top sports stories of the day with the local experts of Locked On, plus our national shows covering every league. Find Locked On Sports Today now available on the free Fire TV channels app. I hope we're joining. We're joined by Jordan Capozzi, the executive producer of Q Sports Talk on ESPN Syracuse Channel ninety seven point seven. We've gone over Judah Mintz's departure and some of Syracuse's initial impressions of this off season, and now it's time to ask the question, Jordan. With all that being said, right now at the time of this recording on April fourteenth at eight twenty p.m. Eastern, do you think Syracuse is going to be better in twenty twenty five? Wow, way too early. My gut reaction is just a strong yes, to be honest. I just didn't want to be too right in your face with it. I mean, look, there's two guys who we already talked about who could really come in and help this team add a little bit of experience to the experience you're going to get just from guys, uh, you know, playing another year. I loved Quidier Copeland and Judah Mintz. Um, I think... Add in Benny, he's also gone. I think there's a chance that the team could just be more consistent. I think those were three guys who, you know, we've all heard different things and we've all seen people come and go. I think uh, the most interesting thing with Quadir is Coach Autry said on one of our shows that the decision to transfer was mutual. And I think a coach saying that is pretty strong. Uh, so I think there's reason to believe that uh, while Quadir was the energy burst and all the guys loved him, um, I think with Quadir, Judah, and Benny out and a bunch of these grad students, fifth-year guys potentially coming in, uh, I think we can see a whole different dynamic, which will lead to hopefully better playing on the road. There was a time where it seemed like Syracuse could not win a road game if their life depended on it, which it kind of did at times uh, last season. Um, I would like to see what they do also with the other two spots. Um We'll see how that goes because, like you mentioned, if they do bring in Dakota from Mount St. Mary's, then you know you might want more of a pure point guard. Um, I know BJ Freeman from Milwaukee is yeah. another guy who they've He's been looking forward, at. But that would be a good one. Yeah, yeah, and that wasn't to say uh, that that's going to be the guard because they've had an eye yeah. on a couple of guys, but it's just to say bringing in more experience and guys who you know have gutted it out, played four years, been in different environments. I'm just hoping it makes them more consistent. Uh, at the moment, I do think that they will be better, but also I'm also not going to sit here and be one of those people who says 20 wins is just something to scoff at for Autry's first year. I, I know you have pretty high standards, so I don't know where you stand on that, but I, I think 20 wins in his first season is pretty good. And I think if they're around that level, um, you obviously got to be on the other side and get in the tournament at this point. But I, I don't think it's going to be like, you know, something crazy like they're i don't think they're gonna go out and win the acc prove me wrong but i think just a couple more wins sneak in the tournament that's the progress you need and i think they're gonna be more than equipped to do it um i've also seen and i forgot where so forgive me but i saw somewhere uh on social media that the offense next year that it could be different that they could be running you know a lot more sets and different types of motions and I, things I, that we didn't really I did see, see that. I, I don't remember where I saw it, but mm -hmm. it might be because they might have better players next year so they can actually do that. You're a big, just get better players guy. I am an enormous get better players because last season you had, it, why? Oh, Judah Mintz has the ball in his hands a lot. Okay. Well, who else do you want with the ball in his hands? Who else can create their own shot? Uh, Starling can. Who else? Who else on the starting lineup last year could create yeah, their own shot? You're right. And even with JJ, I think going into the year and the numbers at Notre Dame didn't necessarily show it. So maybe people were wrong to assume this, but I think that people thought uh, JJ would be more consistent from deep. He had the big game against Pitt, I want to say it was. And yeah, then, another one against Carolina. Too. Yeah, but his game was mainly uh, mid-range this season, which is good, but... Um, He's a guy who I think if he could have been more consistent from three, it would have totally opened up the floor. And, uh, yeah, no, you're totally right in the sense that there were times where it was Judah 1v5, see what happens. And if they help and you can find Bell in the corner or you can find Malik cutting to the hoop, uh, good luck. But Yeah, I mean, if Chris Bell last year was not hitting his shot, 
You know Judah would get you 15 to 20 every night. You know Starling, if he doesn't pop off, will give you 10. Malik will get you 10. And then after that, it was looking around here. I I, I don't know uh, who, who else, who, who else is here. I do have really high standards for this team, but I was happy with 20 wins. I thought that was really good because consider what was going on during the season. I didn't think it was that talented of a team. Like I think when you look at the roster compared to the amount of wins they had, it doesn't add up. I, I look at their roster last year and I'm like, you got five. I don't want to be too harsh here, but you got five like legitimate players here. And then everyone else can't really play and, and the ACC at least. And they still won 20 games and still, you know, if they win at Clemson in the end of the regular season, maybe could have slid their way into the tournament. Overall though, I mean, it's early. But I'm going to also agree with you that they're going to be better this year. Now, to further that point, you know all about the Sporting News article, which was had them in the top 10. So I also have to ask you this question. Do you think Syracuse is at least going to be ranked in the preseason top 25? Not the top 10. I mean, we can forget the top 10. I mean, that's brutal because you're kind of asking me to figure out who else they're going to bring in. Um, okay, to be hypothetically, honest with hypothetically you. since since you since you have done a lot of research and all the Instagram followings and everything, you did. I, BJ Freeman, I heard, was like on an IG live with Naheem McLeod, which, by the way, I want to say this about Naheem McLeod. He is the John Calipari of basketball players. This man is on a recruiting mission right now. Shout out Big Duke. Let me tell you, Naheem McLeod, he was on our drive time radio show right when he committed because he liked a post about him. And then we DM'd him. We were able to because he hadn't, you know, been a member of the school yet. Yep. And then he's just like, yeah, I'll come on. And we're like, why is your nickname Big Duke? And he's like, because I'm big and I like the Marmaduke comic or something. So that's the type of guy he is. He's just a fun, uh, goofy guy, um, which is perfect for recruiting. Um, he's a guy who you hang out with him. You go on his IG live. You want to go play with him. Uh, in terms of your original question, went on a tangent. I don't see it personally. Uh, I do think that Syracuse, in terms of the national you know, respect, I feel like it's dropped a little bit in recent years just due to the you know spotty record of getting into the tournament. When they do, it's kind of they sneak in and then just make a run if, say, Buddy Bayheim goes off. Uh, so I don't think they're going to get that early season respect just because they bring in some mid-major transfers with experience. Uh, but I do think what that allows you to do is, you know, grow early in the season, go on a run. And, and I could see a situation definitely where they're ranked during the season at some point and they'll have opportunities, uh, you know, in different tournaments, uh, Legends Classic, I believe they're in. They're also in talks to be in that uh, that yeah. NIL tournament yeah, in the Vegas. Biggest, which we've, we've talked about it here on this show. They are in talks with it. There was like 13 teams that were listed. Syracuse is one of them. And it seems like a great idea, even though it would be a tough non-con. No, for sure. And yeah, who knows? I mean, maybe that's one of the things that uh, they're telling some of these guys. Like, hey, we're going to be in this tournament and you can make some more money. Uh, who knows? That's a great um, recruiting piece, if so. But uh, no, I don't think they're ranked to start the season. But I would not be shocked whatsoever if at some point during the season, you know, I'm not saying they're going to be a top 10, but you know, somewhere between 20 and 25. I could totally see it happening. Well, for some context here, Syracuse has not been ranked in the AP Top 25 since December of 2018. That was after a five-game win streak when they started 7-2. and two. They were not ranked the following week, and it has been a very long time since that moment. And it's kind of weird for Syracuse basketball to go six years without being a Top 25 team at any point during the season. Very, very weird. Jordan, is there anything else you'd like to add? Orange Nation, 12 to 2 p.m., ESPN Radio Syracuse. Watch on QSportsTalk.com. If you have ever listened to ESPN Syracuse and been like, who's that 12-year-old pestering Stephen Fonte? That's me, and I'd love it if you tuned in and watched us on QSportsTalk. There's a little chat, so hop in there. Um, but other than that, uh, no, I'm hoping to get – I don't want to get them too soon because I don't want to ruin your episode, Jackson, but I'm hoping that we get uh, a few of those guys to – 
come over to Cuse and also the spring game, man. Spring game coming up Saturday. I am amped for that. I'm amped for Syracuse football too. Fran Brown is the truth. Oh, no, we got, we I think we got news it. here. I'm not joking. Oh, we got Benny Williams committing to UCF. Oh, oh, oh that is uh, <laughs> Hold on. That's interesting. There we go. Look Live at on that. Twitter. Look at I that. See, I see. I'm not editing this. I'm not going to edit this out. I saw Joe Tipton tagged me in a photo because he tags me in photos when something Syracuse related happens. And I'm like, oh, my goodness. What is this? I don't oh, know if and, you saw the look on my face when you said that. I was like, this whole thing's in the can. This whole thing's in the can. Good for we're Benny, okay. man. We're okay. Well, if there's if there's one thing that I can say about UCF, I, I'm not, I'm not, he's not moving up from what we thought Syracuse was, I would say, but uh, Florida, man, living in Florida. I got a, I got a good story for you on UCF. Um, so back when I was touring colleges, it was my junior year of high school and I'm from Florida. So UCF was like one of the schools. Like I looked at all of them, UF, FSU, UCF, obviously, which I'm talking about. And of course, Miami, I go to UCF. I'm on the football field uh, with my dad and a couple of my friends who I was also touring with. And I look up and I see that they have like in, in carved into their stadium that they were like the 2017 national champions or something for football. And I turn to my dad and I say, I'm not applying to this school. <laughs> I will not apply to this school. I will not do it. Absolutely not. There is no reason for it. I, I can never be associated with a school that calls themselves the national champions because by the, the, pros, the, the, the property where if you beat this team who beat this team who beat this team, you call yourselves the national champions. And actually had the audacity to put it on their stadium. Well, it wasn't, didn't they? I could be wrong. Wasn't they, they finished undefeated, did they? they? That's totally different. That's they totally finished different. Unde, they finished undefeated, but they didn't win the national championship. I believe Alabama won it that year. But don't call it transitive property garbage. It was the That's transitive property because they beat Auburn, who beat Alabama that year. And I'm like, congratulations. You beat Auburn in a bowl game when they're resting all their starters. How about this? UCF can keep that banner, but Syracuse men's basketball game gets one for the COVID year where they beat UNC and then college hoops ended. I'll take that trade right now. Okay. Okay. That, that I remember that. That's fine. I believe on that same night I was at a Miami heat game. It was the yeah. last game before I was at an NBA game before, uh, during the Rudy Gobert situation and the whole COVID fun fact. It was there. It was crazy. Anyways, uh, the end of the show here got a little bit off the rails, but Jordan, I appreciate you taking the time and make sure to check out Q Sports Talk from 12 to 2, Orange Nation. And guys, if you like this video, click that like button and make sure you subscribe to the channel and turn on those notifications so you know right away when I'm dropping the next episode. And you never know when there's going to be breaking news here on Locked on Syracuse. Take care, everyone.